Okay, good afternoon. This is the Tuesday, May 17th, 2022 meeting of the Transportation Parking Commission. My name is Donald Scalia. I'm the Director of Public Works. I'm also the Chair. Um, and uh, Beth, if you are ready, please, um, could you please call the roll? Um, and I do need to announce that this um, meeting is being audio and video recorded. Beth, go ahead. Donna, are you here? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. Adam? Nope. Uh, Diana? Yes. Okay, thank you, Beth. Number. Okay, thank you, Beth. I believe we have a quorum. Okay, next up is um, public comment. So if there are any members of the public here who, we to, who wish to speak to the commission on uh, any topic, you're welcome to do so now. If you are here to speak um, on anything that's on the agenda, I ask that you hold your comments until that time, just makes for a more uh, organized meeting. Um, but if you're here to speak to something that is not on the agenda, please raise your virtual hand and we will recognize you and, and you're welcome to speak to us. So um, is there anyone who has any comments uh, for the commission today? Okay, I don't see any hands, virtual or otherwise. Okay, so we move on to approval of the minutes from prior meeting, March 15th, 2022. May um, I have a motion to approve the minutes, please? So moved, Ms. Wayne. Seconded, Jody. Okay, is there any discussion on the minutes from March 15th, 2022? Okay, hearing none. Beth, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. Adam here? Still no Adam? Nope. And Diana? Yes. That passes it uh, unanimously. Okay, thank you, Beth. Okay, next up is reports from departments and subcommittees. So I'll uh, take care of the DPW update. So our 2021 paving project has resumed and the contract is doing punch list items, uh, line striping and, and uh, various other things to finish up this project. Um, including driveway repairs, uh, sidewalk work, and, and uh, other things um, that will complete this contract. Um, so we just finished up line painting on Meadow Street and Pine Street um, and actually installed something called sharrows, which are shared lane markings. Um, and these symbols bring awareness to drivers that the roadway is a shared space and that bicycles may be in the roadway. Um, we also uh, have several ongoing mass DOT projects on King Street, Damon Road, and Route 5. Questions about these projects should be directed to mass DOT District 2, as uh, District 2 has jurisdiction over all these areas and, um, and the contractors who are working in them. Um, so that's DPW updates. Wayne, do you have anything? Uh, just a couple of quick things. So we have three construction projects underway, all of which you've heard about before, but the, the PBTA bus stop opposite the post office, um, the Pleasant Street uh, bike and ped project, and the Laurel Street sidewalks, they're all in various states of construction. And then the project in Florence um, for sidewalks and ramps will be next. And then finally, the Laurels, the uh, um, project in Leeds, uh, by Route 9 and Leonard Street. That, that they should all start within next month. That's it. Okay, thanks, Wayne. I appreciate it. Okay, anyone else have any updates for the commission? Counselors? Donna, Phil Goff joined if you want to give him okay. that. Yep, made him a, made him a co-host, so he should be able to uh, share his screen now. Okay. Right. Thank you, Donna. Okay, thanks, Phil. Welcome. 
Okay, so next up, um, perfect timing, Phil, is the Complete Streets Prioritization Plan. Uh, Phil Goff is with us from VHB, and um, I believe he's going to be sharing his screen. And uh, Phil, the floor is yours. Okay, um, give me a minute. I thought I would be at more like 4.30, 4.45, but I'm glad I came on right at 4.05. And I'm just opening the PowerPoint. Okay, sorry. And... Well, Phil does this, I'll, I'll give a yeah. very quick introduction. So Complete Streets Program, which Phil's going to talk about is a NASDAQ spending program. So as Phil goes through, don't think of this as being our true priorities for Complete Streets. It's really our priorities for asking NASDAQ for funding from this program. We got funding before, this is our second round. The first time around, I wrote the plan working with this committee and bike peg committee, and frankly, the MassDOT process was simpler. This time around, um, we got MassDOT funding for the prioritization plan, so they're, they're paying the VHB costs, and it was more complex, so we couldn't have done it in-house. So, Phil, the rest is yours. Great. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that, because there, there was on occasion a little confusion that the Complete Streets prioritization plan was, in essence, Kind of like you know a, a rethinking of the pedestrian bike master plan it isn't necessarily the case so thanks for that um clarification is everyone seeing elm street on your screens yep okay so the shared screen's working great um well thank you so much for having me at um, tonight's transportation and parking commission meeting it was certainly a pleasure to work with wayne and other city staff and the community and the uh, bicycle and pedestrian subcommittee on the complete streets prioritization plan um, over the you know, past uh, five or six months. And I just have a brief presentation about uh, 15 minutes or so um, to kind of go through the process and what the results of the planning work was and then be happy to take your questions for as, as long as you'd like. So just to kind of start it on the basics, I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with uh, what is a complete street? A safe, comfortable, convenient uh, way for people to travel on foot, bike, transit, and automobile for anyone regardless of age or ability. And I think that um, you know this, this slide five years ago or so would have been, I think, more enlightening for people. But I think, especially in a um, city like Northampton, I think um, you know people, uh, including most of you, I'm sure, are on, on board with this concept. And certainly. Um, uh, Mass DOT has been, you know, very strong supporter of Complete Streets and um, have developed the Complete Streets funding program that goes back um, six or seven years now. It is a just a, a, a quick summary of, of what the program is that some of you may be familiar with. It is a three-tiered program. Uh, tier one is really all about adopting a Complete Streets policy, which Northampton did in, I think, 2015. Um, tier two is develop a complete streets prioritization plan. Um, and for tier two, there is funding available uh, if desired. And uh, city of Northampton did the prioritization plan and kind of wrapped it in with the pedestrian bike comprehensive plan in some work that I was um, privileged to be part of in 2016 and 2017. Um, that funding source was different, um, wasn't the MassDOT uh, Complete Streets funding program, and therefore the city was in fact eligible to receive a tier two grant uh, to pay for the work that uh, I and VHB uh, did for this, uh, this uh, update uh, after five years, the five year update to the prioritization plan uh, that we just completed. Tier three is then, um, a uh, requesting or a grant, uh, a grant process for MassDOT to provide um, funding of, uh, depending on kind of where you are in the, in the cycle, up to 400,000, but for the city of Northampton's case, it's 321,000, $395 that's available from MassDOT um, to either pay for the entirety or for a portion of, um, of projects that are uh, part of the Complete Streets Prioritization Plan that uh, was developed uh, for the Tier 2 process. So that's kind of a little uh, overview of um, kind of the background to how we got to the place of, um, uh, of the city 
receiving grant funding from MassDOT to bring DHB on board to do the update to the prioritization plan. So can I, just, I want to add one thing, just so people know. Yeah, yeah so please, we've anytime. Two of these, we've gotten two of these grants so far. So a portion of the work between um, Hamden Avenue and Hockman Road that we did three or four years ago, that was with the $400,000 Complete Streets grant. And then the on-ramp we did to the Mass Central Rail Trail from Edwards Square, that was with a, about $79,000 um, Complete Street. So those are the two grants we've gotten so far as a result of this program. Yep, great. And, and you'll see an image of that in just a second. Um, you know, MassDOT has eligibility requirements for projects. I mean, clearly the, uh, what they're uh, willing and interested in funding are, are projects that promote complete streets, that promote safety, walking and bicycle facilities, transit facilities, uh, facilities that uh, uh, enhance safety related uh, to kind of traffic flow for all roadway users as well. Um, so MassDOT does have a, a list of various projects. You can see many of them listed here, the kinds of facilities for um, you know, pedestrian safety and bicycle safety, transit facilities that certainly you are aware of and have seen in Northampton. And um, you know, generally it wasn't an issue in this process uh, for us to come up with uh, uh, project recommendations that we knew would be eligible for the Complete Streets funding. One of the things that uh, isn't up here, but kind of a critical part of the eligibility requirements is that um, you know uh, funding is not provided, no matter what the facility is, even if it's on this list, to any uh, mass DOT roadway. So it's all really local streets and intersections um, that are eligible for the uh, funded improvements from mass DOT. Uh, part of the process we started early on was to review some of the key uh, studies and plans and reports that have already been developed by the city and incorporates um, recommendations from them um, where, where needed and where, uh, where relevant. So we started certainly with the uh, Complete Streets Prioritization Plan that was submitted to uh, MassDOT in 2016. And as Wayne said, there was a, a handful of projects that uh, were funded uh, as part of uh, that prioritization plan in 2016, including the connection to the Mass Central Rail Trail. And here's an aerial uh, view of that little uh, path connection, which is a, a terrific project. Um, we also reviewed the uh, public sidewalk inventory analysis project. That was another project that I was involved with in 2018, uh, the PVPC Regional Transportation Plan. And then of course, the Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan um, that has since you know, just adopted last year, but it incorporated the Walk Bike Northampton plan, which is the you know, de facto pedestrian and bicycle master plan from, from 2017. So we, um, you know, VHB, the VHB team went through these sources, pulled out the projects that we thought would, would be relevant to, um, uh, to introduce as part of the foundation for the prioritization plan update for 2022. The process also included uh, data collection and um, GIS mapping. You see a handful of the maps here, and these are all in the report. Um, the summary memorandum that I believe was forwarded to all the commissioners. Um, we looked at traffic volume and speed. We looked at the, uh, the both the on-street and the off-street path network and uh, bike lanes and sidewalks in the city. You see the second map um, at right. Um, just to have an understanding of you know where that infrastructure is and where we, where there may be the gaps and, and um, you know where there might be the need for uh, enhanced facilities for, for walking and biking. Uh, we look the transit network, of course. You know we want to accommodate uh, potential improvements to uh, transit accessibility for pedestrians and bicyclists and you know crashes um, and depending on the shape and the color indicated severity and whether the crash related to a pedestrian or a bicyclist. Uh, the public engagement as part of this plan process included two meetings with the Bicycle Pedestrian um, Subcommittee. Uh, the first one was last November um, where we presented the scope of work to the subcommittee. We kind of did a round robin with committee members to talk about the goals for the plan and kind of you know some of their ideas 
um, and, and possible uh, project recommendations. And we did that as, as part of an interactive exercise using an online tool called Mural where people were able to um, put different icons um, and in essence, you know, post-it notes. This was something we did in about um, you know, 40, 45 minutes. So it wasn't you know, too complex, but it, it certainly gave a good number of ideas for additional project recommendations that we did incorporate into the plan and were part of the evaluation. The second meeting, uh, the follow-up meeting with the subcommittee was a, a couple of months later when we had developed you know, approximately 40 uh, Complete Streets uh, project recommendations uh, that you see in the map were uh, kind of uh, spread uh, throughout all the neighborhoods. Uh, in the city, and um, it was kind of a work session with the committee to go through each of those projects, look at the location, describe what they were, and um, uh, receive comments from the committee. We also talked about the evaluation criteria that was then used um, to evaluate what was 40 projects, it got narrowed down a little bit uh, to 37 projects based on some comments, and uh, the evaluation uh, criteria here here's you know roughly the location of the 37 projects the sort of you know the broader list of projects that include um you know both uh, kind of point projects so you can see as the dots these are just like in essence intersection improvements for pedestrians or intersection improvements for you know general traffic calming and safety uh, and then also the lines indicate the, you know the corridors uh, the uh, bicycle corridor projects, pedestrian corridors, which in essence typically were filling in sidewalk gaps, um, and then uh, corridors where traffic traffic calming was the primary objective uh, and recommendation. So the uh, evaluation uh, criteria, which we developed uh, both with city staff and with the bicycle and pedestrian subcommittee, included uh, 12 different criteria. Um, we a lot of the discussion uh, revolved around uh, weighting for each of the criteria um, and really trying to give a, an understanding or have an understanding and sort of promote additional points for projects that were, would do things that you know were um, you know a higher a higher goal for uh, city staff or for the subcommittee such as proximity to schools and primary business districts. You can see that. Um, you know, all the criteria got five points, and then that one in particular uh, was weighted, you know, multi a multiplier of four. Others had multipliers of three or two, and a few had multipliers of one, just to indicate their relative importance and prominence to city staff and to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Subcommittee um, in terms of providing points um, for the purpose of ranking these. Um, all these criteria, of course, there's a, a longer memo that uh, goes along with these criteria um, where we worked out with city staff uh, all of the, the various thresholds uh, for how to provide points. So if it's you know, one through five points, depending on traffic volume, what the volume thresholds were, speeds and where those cutoffs are, that's, uh, that is described in, in more detail in the appendix of the report as well. So it's 130. Um, a point total um, as we evaluated each of the projects when we evaluated all the 37 recommendations. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was the preference of the city to include uh, the 20 highest scoring um, project recommendations into the spreadsheet that is submitted to MassDOT. And this is a template spreadsheet that MassDOT does expect all their prioritization plans to be submitted to them. Uh, they do require a minimum of 15 projects. Uh, we provided, as I said, uh, 20. Of those 20, 11 of them involve pedestrian safety benefits. 16 were more bicycle safety related, and five were related to transit accessibility. Obviously, that adds up, adds up to more than 20, but a number of these projects certainly benefited the safety for uh, both pedestrians and bicyclists, even some of the transit accessibility projects had a safety, pedestrian safety benefit component as well. So again, this is what has been formally submitted and approved um, by MassDOT. Um, these are the 20 projects that um, are potentially eligible for the up to 321,000 uh, over the next four year period. 
uh, to fund some of these through the tier three program. Give you a little sense of where the um, highest scoring projects were that um, were submitted to MassDOT as part of the uh, potential tier three funding. You can see that you know clearly many of the projects were concentrated around uh, downtown Northampton, um, uh, downtown uh, Florence, and up to Look Park, and a few in some of the uh, adjacent neighborhoods. And I wanted to, you know, of the 20 projects, I won't go through all of them, but I just wanted to give you, you know, a snapshot of some of the uh, high scoring projects. Again, these aren't in any particular order other than the first one, the uh, New South Street, bike lanes on New South Street actually scored the highest. It was, uh, it received 104 out of uh, 130 points. Um, and it eliminates a pretty critical gap in the bike network, especially when bicycle improvements in the coming years um, are developed on Main Street. There's a 600 gap network, a uh, 600 foot gap in the network between Main Street and the existing bike lanes on, uh, on South Street uh, that are the uh, recommended project here. Uh, it, it will likely require the restriction of some parking on the west side, kind of depends how long the uh, turn lanes on the approach to Main Street uh, would need to be accommodated, but there will be uh, likely some lo uh, lost parking of this project as part of this project, but it is a striping and signage project relatively low cost uh, for $60,000 to create that really critical link. Another high scoring one that was up close to 100 points as well um, was uh, improved bike parking in the downtown area. Um, you know, a, a number of racks, I'm actually forgetting, I think we assume 30 or so bike racks in our cost estimate of $110,000, but there was a real uh, desire, especially by the uh, bicycle and pedestrian subcommittee to have a covered bike parking kiosk, similar to the one you see at a number of uh, MBTA stations in the Boston area, having something um, there uh, either adjacent to Pulaski Park or somewhere in the area and proximate to the PVTA uh, pulse point. So commuters and others could park and keep their bikes um, out of the uh, rain and the snow. Uh, State Street traffic calming was another high scoring project, provides obviously a great connection for both peds and bikes from the MCRT uh, to downtown. It, it, it does have a mix of curb extensions, raised crosswalks, bike lanes where there is an opportunity to fit them in, like in this uh, segment of State Street that you see in the image, ADA curb ramps. This was a, obviously a more expensive project because it involved some uh, bump outs and moving some curbs around. So this was 510,000. Uh, Locust Street bike lanes, important connection between downtown Florence and uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital and the bike lanes on Elm Street and North Elm Street. There's a four lane section, which you know is uh, problematic from both the bike accessibility point of view, but also um, pedestrian crossings at the uh, crosswalk. So this is you know, bike lanes, but also provides a uh, real potential uh, safety benefit for pedestrians as well with the opportunity for a crossing island in the center of the roadway for 80,000. A few more here, West Street Crossing was another um, critical pedestrian safety improvement at a single intersection, narrowing that um, uh, crossing location with a a bump out at the corner and a median refuge island. This is a $170,000 project, uh, sidewalks along Florence Road. Um, that would be a mix of new, uh, new sidewalks in the gap, in the gap south of uh, Florence Heights uh, down to Brookwood Drive, but also sidewalk repair, which is in pretty uh, bad shape. The asphalt sidewalks and asphalt curb that's deter deteriorating north of Florence Heights, that's a $300,000 project. And then finally, um, uh, a couple others I wanted to highlight, very low cost, actually the lowest cost project of the lot was a $10,000 kind of signage project uh, to incorporate uh, the W1115 signs, which you see in the image at all of the uh, crossing locations of the rail trails throughout the city, there's 11 location and um, you know there is the recommendation for incorporating flashing beacons in some locations but that was not included part of the cost estimate and then final final project just to touch upon was 
a uh, connection to uh, the bus stop at uh, Berkshire Terrace and Locust Street, and that involved improving the path through the small park at Main and uh, Locust and adding a sidewalk on the south side um, from Trinity Row to, again, to the bus stop at Berkshire Terrace for 120,000. So that was just, um, you know, eight uh, of the 20 projects I thought might be interesting to highlight just so you get a, a flavor of the type of complete streets projects that are included um, in the prioritization plan that has been submitted to MassDOT. Um, and uh, the tier three process will be um, working its way through um, over the next coming months. And uh, I know the city would will be looking forward to receiving funding for a handful of these projects. So I'm happy to go back to the larger map or any other slide um, while we're answering questions. Okay, thanks, Phil, I appreciate it. I guess I'll stop sharing my screen. Or did I just, you still seeing my screen? We are, yes. Yeah. All right, so first I'll um, open up to any uh, commissioners, any comments on uh, or questions for Phil? Councillor Foster, go ahead. This, this is great to see laid out in a map. Thank you. Um, if I were queen for the day, they would all be done and then we'd, we'd take on the next priority. So it's great to see. Um, I just wanted to bring up one thing that, that has come up in various conversations regarding covered bike storage, but to make, um, just as we're thinking about it, or you know, and in, in if that is one that were to get funded, just to be sure that that bike storage accommodates more than two wheel bikes, um, but so many parents with child trailers or people with cargo trailers or, yeah. um, you know, larger, larger bikes, um, yeah. just to be sure that it can accommodate, that it's not so tightly packed that it's accommodating more than traditional two wheel bikes. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a good point, and that is important when uh, developing uh, bike parking areas. And I think that you know the the primary cost um, that's involved in the one hundred and ten thousand dollar estimate is is the the awning um, that would need you know the you know potentially a, a a concrete pad and the awning above, and then the arrangement of the bike racks and the type of bike racks. You know, there's flexibility there. There could be you know extra space um, uh, with with clearance for larger bikes, adult trikes, cargo bikes, et cetera. So um, that, that could be accommodated uh, if funding is procured for that, for that project. Great. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Phil from members of the commission? Okay, seeing none, I'll uh, open it up to uh, members of the public or other counselors who might be here who have any comments on this. Um, please feel free to raise your hand and, and um, I'll unmute you. Okay, seeing and hearing none. Phil, I appreciate your presentation so much. Thank you very okay. much for your, for your efforts on this. And uh, final Thank call you. for uh, final call for anyone else. I don't know, Wayne, if you have anything else to, to add to this, but we appreciate your time, Phil, and we appreciate you being here. And the only thing I'll add sure. is, as, as Phil mentioned, you know, we will be applying for funds, so we'll be looking for input um, from you know within these these project priorities. We don't have to the number one project priority, so. We'll be looking for ideas for that. That's the bike head committee's agenda as well. Um, you can guess we both have priorities based on what do we need, but also which projects are ready. So, you know, for example, there are projects that Phil worked on that, that are near the high school, but DPW is a study out, so we don't really know what those are. So if we applied today, we couldn't apply for the high school. So readiness is, is going to be part of our criteria. So think about this in the future meetings where we'll come back and ask you for input. Karen, okay. yeah, that, so Wayne, that brought up a, a question then. So you'll come back in future meetings when you're ready to prioritize. I, I just wanted to make sure we would know um, how that would how that would be solicited. Yeah, I mean, you know, the plan shows our priorities. So we think those are our priorities, but we always look at opportunities. So, you know, if the third item is ready to go, 
um, and more competitive than the first item, we would go to the third item. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anything else? Okay, again, Phil, thank you so much for your time and for being here, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Take care. All right, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to proposed ordinance relative to parking on Stoddard Street now. Um, I will read the ordinance and then explain. So in the year 2022, upon the recommendation of Transportation and Parking Commission, this is an ordinance relative to parking on Stoddard Street. An ordinance of City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows. Section one, that's section 312-102 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-102, schedule one, parking prohibited at all times. Location, Stoddard Street, side, northwest from a point 410 feet northeasterly from Prospect Street to State Street. Location, Stoddard Street, side southeast from Prospect Street to a point 420 feet northeasterly from Prospect Street. And location, Stoddard Street, side south from State Street to a point 85 feet westerly from State Street. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? I'll make that motion, Jody. May I have a second, please? Second, Karen. Okay, thank you, Councillor Foster. Um, so by way of explanation, this ordinance was generated in response to a parking request which stated the following issue. Usually people know to park so that the car can weave through the parked cars to make it safely down the road. From time to time, both sides of the road have parked cars and it is difficult for a small car to drive between them. An emergency vehicle would not be able to pass down the road to get to a home. So as part of this parking request, it, it, was, um, it was asked if parking be limited to one side of the road. So what we did in our assessment is we, you know, we take a look at the road and we determine that um, you know, the, the uh, requester um, is talking about a, a very narrow side street that, that can be parked up at, at certain times. Um, and what we want to do is we want to make sure that when we come in and make any improvements that we are not um, creating a problem, um, you know, for residents who live there or, um, you know, for uh, uh, motorists who may sort of see parking restricted to one side and then drive a little bit uh, faster than they should. So, um, Chief, would you be willing to speak to the uh, speed data that you collected or that your department collected off of Stoddard Street? Just run through that real quickly for us. Um, sure, I'll have to do it by memory. We had a power outage today and my computer is not uh, fully functional yet, but uh, we did install uh, the speed data collection devices on the street and determined that there is uh, no speeding problem on Stoddard Street. Actually, most of the vehicles operated uh, well under the posted speed limit. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. And what we wanted to do is, is just do that analysis prior to making any changes here so we know sort of what we're dealing with. And then, you know, when we do make changes, we don't want to create a problem. So um, the map that you see on the screen share in front of you actually um, uses the concept of staggered parking as uh, a, a way to solve the problem that, that the um, that the person who made this request was talking about and also um, kind of creates like a natural traffic calming scenario whereby cars are, are don't see like a straight shot down the street they actually you know are going to have to move from side to side of, of the road um, because of the way we have the no parking zones staggered so um, that is kind of how this ordinance came to be and I see some folks from the neighborhood here and and I'm happy to um, recognize anyone who has comments. I know Councillor Moulton is also here um, or was. So um, anyone who has any comments or questions about this, I'm uh, happy to field them. Okay, Laurel, see your hand up. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, if you could just say your name and uh, address for the record, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Sure, this is Laurel Rogers. I'm 17 Stoddard Street. 
Um, most of the neighbors ha seem on board. Um, I believe there was one accident since we last talked about this where there are two cars parked right across from each other. So that reinforces that this is a good idea. Um, we have had some extra parking on our street from Prospect lately. So I'm hoping that this doesn't make things too crowded. Um, but one comment that we got from several people is that um, after the lights go in, uh, we would like to be able to come back to you if we find that there's a lot more traffic on the street, because this is a real pedestrian and biking street because of the rail trail and the bikes that are at the end and people walking to stop and shop. So we, we just wanna make sure it stays in that category being really easy for kids to be able to bike in the street and that kind of thing. Um, and that's all. I, I, I believe I had a whole bunch of requests, but Donna, you address them all and things are probably in progress. Oh, yes. Okay. So that was the, um, yeah, yes. Okay. So that was, um, you were that behind was that email. Okay. All right. Super. Okay. Yes. We're, we're working through all of those issues. So thank you. Okay. But that was all. I just, we're, we're hopeful it'll be a positive thing and, um, and we'll see. Okay. Thanks for your comments. Appreciate it. Sue, I see your hand up. Hi there. Thanks everybody for all your thoughtful consideration. A group of us did walk up and down and um, thanks for the offer to paint. The crosswalk doesn't actually like line up with the curb cut and some of those things I know are bigger problems, but um, just thank you very much. And this sounds like it should be good. I didn't realize it was an issue, but um, people were in very engaged and appreciative of your work. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks. So, yeah, we're going to be coming through the city, and and we're going to be uh, striping all crosswalks and and uh, line markings. Um, really, everything that's on the asphalt is going to get freshened up, um, and that crosswalk will receive some attention as part of that. Councilor Motlin, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, Stoddard is is one street over from where I live on Perkins, so I'm very familiar with Stoddard. I have talked with uh, Susan and Laurel, uh, among others, about this solution, um, which uh, residents of Stoddard have, have been working on with their neighbors for a number of months. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone who is uh, who has any concerns about this staggered no parking. I think it's a great solution. And as Director Lascalia said, it does address both the issues of, of occasional congestion on Stoddard uh, resulting from parking on both sides, as well as the concern about uh, it becoming um, perhaps uh, uh, more used once that traffic light uh, goes into effect uh, on uh, on the state and uh, and uh, Finn streets, so it's a great solution. I, I think it's a great uh, example of uh, the city uh, really responding to concerns uh, expressed by a neighborhood, and uh, I am very supportive of this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. I appreciate that. Okay, anyone else have any comments on this proposed ordinance? Comments from members of the commission. Okay, seeing and hearing none, we have a motion on the floor for a positive recommendation for this. Beth, could you call the roll, please? Donna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Wayne? Sorry, yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. Adam's still not here. Um, Diana. Yes. Passes unanimously. Okay, thank you, Beth. Next is a proposed ordinance relative to parking on Ward Avenue. I'll read the ordinance. City of Northampton, Massachusetts in the year 2022 upon the recommendation of the Transportation Parking Commission, an ordinance relative to parking on Ward Avenue, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows. Section one. 
that section 312-102 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-102, Schedule 1, parking prohibited at all times. Location Ward Avenue, side south from James Avenue to a point 75 feet westerly from James Avenue. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? I'll make that motion, Jody. May I have a second, please? Second, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, so by way of explanation, um, this is a 75 foot parking, a proposed parking restriction on Ward Avenue by the path to the Mill River Trail. Uh, DPW has water, sewer, and drain utilities uh, that actually go down that path and we need access for maintenance uh, to all of these utilities. Ward Avenue has one lane of travel in east and western directions between James Avenue and the dead end. It's about 1,030 feet long and 27 feet wide. There's one existing restriction. Parking is not allowed on the north side. Um, by James Avenue and a point 100 foot, 150 feet westerly from what we're talking about. So basically um, directly across the street, um, you can see on, on the map that's, that's, um, that's up. So, you know, the issue here is that we have uh, uh, utilities that run down this path and we actually had a fairly significant problem with our drain line that created a sinkhole and required our external contractor to be able to access the path. Um, there were cars blocking the path, um, and that just creates a delay, um, it, you know, where it was a drainage utility and not a sewer utility. I mean, time is always of the essence because there's um, expense to, to um, the city anytime we mobilize a contractor or mobilize our own uh, staff. Um, but if this had been like a sanitary sewer problem, um, you know, time is really of the essence. And if we have cars blocking access, um, that definitely creates a, a major problem for us. So what we are looking to do is just take this 75 foot section that's directly in front of the path and prohibit parking. It's the equivalent of, you know, just under four parking spaces. Um, if you say that a, a, a typical parking space requires about 20 feet, um, that's typical how we measure a parking space. Um, so all we're trying to do is, is just kind of open this area up in the event that we need to mobilize, you know, trailers or an excavator or something. Um, and, it, you know, again, we just had an incident there uh, a couple of months ago that required a response and we're grateful it wasn't a, a sore problem. Um, you know, which would require a, a quicker response. So that is the intent behind what we're trying to do here. And um, I don't know if there's anyone, any member of the public here who, who wishes to speak to this. Uh, Dave, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Unmute you. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, I live at 10th Avenue, the path. Uh, goes through my property. Um, yeah, I, I was the one that called in the incident with the sewer pipe, this or the street drain uh, to DPW. We'll say you did a great job. You came out right away. You put up barrels. You got in there. Um, it was a week later where the contractor came out. There could have a weekend plus a day or so. Um, I was here. There were no temporary, no parking signs, construction signs put up. Um, You've needed access to that trail once in 11 years. I've offered keys and I had to run them around between the sewer department and the water department. No one wanted to even talk about that. They had no idea what it was. Um, I finally got the head of engineering over at the sewer department. This was years ago. And he said, oh, I'll just knock on your door if we need access. It didn't sound like any emergency. Um, like I said, you've used it once. What happens is in the summer, only certain days of the year when it's really crowded, really nice days, they start to move down to our driveways and it is near impossible to get out when, they, when people start parking because they park really tight to the driveways. It's a public good that I offer through my yard and by adding these four spaces, moving them down, it's really gonna impact our parking. And I don't understand for the life of me why you can't put a two hour no parking zone there, which would solve everyone's problem. You know, you are not going to need access you haven't needed access um ever in that sort of emergency time frame 
it would allow people to park there because it's all short-term parking. I mean, at most, I, my son will park near my driveway overnight. Other than that, it's always open. Um, if people just hike the trail, maybe go for a swim, and they come back and they get in their car. There's just no need for this. It's over. It's a solution chasing a problem that doesn't exist is really what I've just said multiple times. And I still see it that way. I just, I can't see this. Um, again, you don't even have access. You'd have to, you know, unless you're the guys cutting my locks all the time, once in 11 years, you know, has anyone actually needed to get down there? That's everything I have to say, I guess. Okay, thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who um, wishes to speak on this? Okay, Wayne, go ahead. So this is a question, but is there in between? I mean, I don't know. I don't even know how close people are to park next to a driveway, but for the sake of argument, Nancy will correct me. Let's say it's 15 feet. Could you narrow it down to 50 feet? So enough so you're not blocking the access and for, without making extra distance. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Wayne, I don't think I understand what you're suggesting. Are you suggesting we shrink the the, yeah, the I mean, proposed 75 foot zone? Yeah, is I mean, just suggesting? for the sake of argument, I'm making up numbers, but if that roadway is 15 feet wide and you had a 15 foot buffer on each side, it doesn't solve everything, but it gets it down to 45 feet from 75 feet, it, you know, so what? Yeah, so what I can tell you is I, I actually went to the site and looked at the area, you know, looked at the access and what I have to try to plan for is, you know, we need to back a trailer in there. I have to think about, you know, like what is the, the worst case scenario with a utility break here and what sort of equipment would I need to get in here and what we tried to do when we made this um, this proposed ordinance was look at kind of the topography and look at the features of the roadway. Um, and the 75 feet made the most sense in terms of what the features of uh, the existing features of the roadway are there with existing curb cuts, the path itself, um, and a, a utility pole that's on the side of the, um, the, the access down to the Mill River. Um, and the 75 feet, you know, I thought was a good compromise um, of, you know, a fairly small area, fairly low impact. It would give us the ability to back a trailer down there if we needed it, um, you know, from either direction. So that was where the 75 feet came from. Um, initially, we had thought about going a little bit more. Um, but after some neighborhood engagement, um, you know, we shrank this down and we feel like that this is, a, this is dimensionally good. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on this? And I'll respond to Dave. I see your hand up. Again, go ahead. Yeah, I just wonder what's wrong with an option of two hour parking. It really seems like a reasonable compromise. Um, I can't imagine, given you've never needed emergency access, that two hours isn't a reasonable, a reasonable time to get heavy equipment down there. And it really would stop people from losing those four spaces, which would mean only, you know, that many less days for parking in our driveways. It just, I don't see why we can't compromise here. Yep, and, and I think, um, you know, I can, I can answer this a little bit, but I, I would defer to parking enforcement on this um, to an extent. I mean, you know, two hour parking does require some level of enforcement. Um, so I would look for Nancy for comment on that. So why don't I stop talking and go ahead, Nancy. So when you're talking about two hour parking, to enforce that legally, the parking enforcement officer would have to go to the site and electronically mark each vehicle and then return in over two hours and then check each vehicle to determine whether or not it was on the marked list um, on their handheld devices. That said, because we only have limited number of people, it could be in excess of the two hour limit. It is not going to be a only two hour amount of time. It could be two and a half, it could be three hours. 
So it's not going to be an exact thing. Okay, thanks for the clarification, Nancy. And I, you know what I will also say is it's it's my responsibility to you know sometimes what happens is you know a problem like this comes up and you look at a scenario like this and you say you know wow there's cars completely blocking our access here and when you need access you know in a time of an emergency you know you don't want to have to deal with any sort of a delay or to have to you know have people towed if it really is an emergency these are um fairly large pipes that that run down this easement and you know the way uh utilities work is that you you don't really know you know when there could potentially be a problem um you know so this this has happened once it has happened recently we're now aware that there's a potential issue here um and that's why we're here today so i certainly hear what you're saying about the parking spaces and pushing you know parking elsewhere um but there is an ordinance around uh parking near a driveway um and there nancy what's the dimension on that what's the um what's the footage off a driveway that you're legally allowed to park you have to be more than three feet from the edge of the driveway. So that is an existing, thank you, Nancy. And there, I mean, so there is an existing ordinance and I understand what you're saying. Um, you know, we felt that four uh, parking spaces was not um, a, a, a terrible impact to the neighborhood and gives DPW the access that we need. I just wanna make sure no one else on the commission has any comments and we can go back to you. Dave. Yeah. Jamie, is your hand up? Go ahead. Yeah, director. So do I have this right? So this is private property. There's an easement to allow public passage through there and there's a gate, right? And does DPW or someone have keys to that gate at this time? So the DPW, so the city has an easement um, for its utilities um, to travel down this path. The city has like an easement uh, across this property for water, sewer, and stormwater. Um, regarding public access, I don't know the particulars of, of the story or around that easement. Um, I, I don't know. Um, so uh, regarding having a key, I don't know if my staff has a key in a case where there is, um, in a case where we have a legal easement um, to access our utilities, if there is a private lock blocking that, we would cut the lock and we would go in and we would fix our utilities. Um, whether my sewer department has a key or not, I, I don't know, they may. Um, but we deal with this all over the city where we have an easement across private property and folks put locks up or whatever. And, you know, we can't have a key for 200 different locks. Um, so, you know, we try to contact the property owner if it's not an emergency. If it's an emergency, we, we just have to go in. And Go ahead. Actually, I have a question more for um, Chief Casper. One thing um, I was wondering regarding this path as well is if there's been a need for a public safety response down there. Are, are you aware of that? I would have asked you earlier if I'd thought of it earlier. We, we do have a lot of responses and not a lot. We have some responses down there. Usually we access the area from the ends of the paths. So we kind of figure out, you know, which which side they're closest to. And that's how we typically access that area. I can't think of any that we've responded to for like, you know, critical emergencies with like CPR in progress. It's more that we get complaints of other sorts of behavior down there. And that's how we typically access it is from the ends. Well, I can say as someone that uses that area that there certainly is, especially in the warmer months, um, quite a bit of parking that happens down there. Um, so I guess this would move that parking outward. Uh, I'm not sure how big of a problem that is, but I think it is a concern to consider. Councilor, go ahead. And, and to Jamie's point, actually, so I, I was able to outreach to like 20 to 25 um, folks that live down on Ward Ave um, to talk about this and, and the responses back were mixed. There definitely is a concern um, from people who live down a little further down Ward Ave, partly about um, 
I heard some feedback about the street being narrow and the potential for cars to be parked on both sides of the street. So just one thing I wanted to talk about is what our options may be if that were to become an issue. But then I, I, I did also want to share that some of the feedback I received was um, positive regarding opening up that curve, the road bends there. Um, and so there was um, feedback regarding, um, you know, that, that for sight lines and visibility, some people appreciated that. Of course, then there was a concern that that may speed traffic up. But I just wanted to share that, that a number of households, um, all the, the households on Ward Ave, um, you know, that were in, connected down to the easements on the work, uh, walking path, as well as a bunch of surrounding households. I, I have been in communication with them, um, but probably four of the households um, expressed that concern regarding um, on those days where the, the parking gets pushed back, um, if, if it were to be on both sides or blocking driveway access. So um, I just wanted to think through, um, you know, if those four spots do push that down, you know, what options we may have as a commission for addressing that in the future. Thanks, Councillor. I mean, what, you know, if we find, or let me back up, I'm always, you know, I always caution any time we make any changes that we don't want to create a problem elsewhere. So we don't want to push a problem elsewhere. You know, 75 feet of parking, um, you know, in a best case scenario, you can fit four cars in there. In a real world scenario where folks are not spacing appropriately um, or parking in a little bit of a disjointed way or arriving and leaving at different times, you're more likely talking about three cars. This to me does not, you know, three cars does not to me seem like um, it, it would have um, a, a cascading uh, ripple effect. We're not talking about moving, you know, 14 cars or 10 cars or, or sort of double digit traffic like some of the other parking changes um, that we implement here. So um, this is a, a fairly small area and, and even at four cars, it's, it's um, it, you know, it, to me, it does not seem particularly impactful, um, though understanding I, I'm not a resident of the street, so I'm very sympathetic to, to folks who may feel differently, and that's why we're here to talk about it tonight. Nancy, I see your hand up. Go ahead. And I just wanted to point out with that in mind is that you really can't look at this as 75 feet because there's no parking allowed within 20 feet of an intersection. So you have to not even consider that 20 feet as a parking. Um, as Donna is saying, that means that really the amount of space that she's talking about for people to park in is a relatively small area. And so, Councillor Foster, go ahead. Yeah, just a last uh, comment. Um, Donna, you and I met there in early March to take a look. And I think when you're looking at the map or conceptualizing um, 75 or, or 55 feet, it sounds like a lot. But actually looking, if you, if, for those that are familiar with this path, if you're looking at the path, um, to the right of the path is a telephone pole. And it prohibits parking from that telephone pole to James F. It's, it actually, when you're actually there, feels like quite a small area as Director Lascalia was saying. I just wanted to make sure I really brought up the concerns of residents that were concerned about parking being pushed back. But um, when you're actually physically there at the site, um, you know, it, 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 it is quite a small area right in front of the path. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, Councilor. And I, I do, I just think it, it bears repeating, you know, when we talk about dimensional parking, you know, in a perfect world, if cars park, you know, sort of hood to bumper, it, you know, you're still looking at 20 feet per car. So that's, you know, I just want to sort of reiterate um, that folks generally in a, a, you know, this is not a, a perfect world when people park. Um, Dave, you've been patiently waiting, so we'll unmute you and uh, please jump in again. Or we'll try to unmute you here. There we go. No, go ahead. No. Okay, uh, a couple things. One, um, there is no walking easement. I guess it's historic. Um, it is just a, a 
a utility easement. Um, the town does not have the key. Like I said, I tried to give them the key. No one wanted it. Um, I find the whole two hour thing a little silly because I think you would enforce that when you actually needed it. You wouldn't be enforcing that. I mean, I, I think I've seen parking tickets out there once. So the whole 20 foot from the intersection thing is even a little silly. Um, you know, I hear it's only four cars, but if you push those four cars, it hits my driveway and Nancy's driveway right next door. It doesn't impact anyone else. And everyone in the street has said, you know, you should get the say in this because it's your, it's your yard, you know, and we offer this thing. If you push the no parking on the other side past our two driveways, we wouldn't have an issue, right? Because they could park four feet or three feet, I find out now. You know, the answer I was told is call a tow truck if they actually park too close or put out a lawn chair. You know, it was really silly. Um, that's not what happens, you know, and it gets almost impossible to move out you push the no parking on the other side past our two driveways i think it's probably a non-issue taking away three spots like you said but the three spots are going to push right down to our driveways and it really is a tight road to back out on when that happens when everyone parks on both sides of that road which in the by the way in the summer people do pack bumper to bumper in there because it is crowded i don't know how often you've been there in the summer um but it's not just normal street parking it's parking for a very busy walking path and swimming hole so anyway my take uh, it sounds like it's just going to get voted on whether i like it or not but i'm going to let you that's my say <laughs> Can you, um, Dave, before, uh, sorry, we uh, muted you prematurely. What is your street address? I'm going to just unmute yep, you. I think I got it that time. Um, 10 Ward Avenue. 10 Ward Avenue. Yeah, okay. and the, the trail actually goes through my property. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Okay, Nancy, I see your hand up. Yeah, I'll just chime in. I'm right next door to Dave. And um, in the summertime, it is very crowded in front of our in front of our house and further down. And it's a narrow street. And the problem is when people come down the street, they have to turn around to park. They pull into the driveways. And <laughs> when people are parked on both sides and people are backing out of driveways, it's it's very congested and it could be dangerous, I think. Um, so the, you know, pe people have said this already, but it, it really does get crowded and it, it, I do think it is pushing the problem down the street and it sounds like there hasn't really been a requirement for access very often. I understand in an emergency, it might be needed, um, but it seems like there would be an ongoing problem. There are usually on most days I've been noticing, there's usually about four cars out there every morning. And so if those cars have to now park where there are driveways on both sides, you know, it'll, it'll restrict access for the turning around cars as well as the residents pulling out. Nancy, what is your street address? 16 Ward. 16. 16, right next to. Okay. Yeah. So initially when we first looked at this, we had a longer no parking zone proposed. Um, and, you know, we uh, did a little bit of neighborhood outreach and actually shrunk this down to um, the dimensions that you see now because we were trying to um, create a scenario where it was is, is least impactful because we don't want to push traffic. So, so what we were trying to do is just sort of dimensionally give us the access we need, but not create a, a negative effect for, for others in the neighborhood. So when we initially first looked at this, we had a much longer parking zone, no parking zone uh, proposed that actually, I believe, stretched um, a good part of the way across the, the frontage of, of Dave's house. Um, Hillary, I see your hand up and we will, um, we will unmute you so that you can chime in here. Hi, I just want to um, reiterate everything that Dave has said. I'm at 17 Ward, so I'm just a tiny bit further down than Nancy. Um, and um, I think that this, as Dave pointed out, this has happened in once in 11 years and it, we're, you're fixing a non-problem and causing inconvenience, um, congestion and hassle for people in the neighborhood. 
and you know i think um uh you know it's been said that only a few people on the street really are, have negative reactions to this um i think you'd find that most people on this end of the street have a very negative uh reaction to this and i in particular have a very very negative reaction to this and i hope you just don't put it in because you you thought it was a good idea at one point and and now it's like hard to say oh well uh let's just let it go okay thanks appreciate your comment counselor foster go ahead yeah a question for you as we're looking at it and um on that feedback around um the no parking zone on the opposite side of the street opposite side of the street and how that leads to the cars turning in and out. Um, I, I haven't looked at it with that eye, but I am wondering about, um, you know, if there's a need, if, if we could come back and consider extending the no parking side on the opposite side of the street um, to accommodate that, if, if, if that is um, becoming, you know, becoming the issue that, that's been um, considered. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, any time that, that a decision is made and then, um, you know, we find that it has impacts that we didn't foresee or that we might have foreseen but weren't sure were going to happen, you know, we can always revisit something. Um, you know, I this is tricky in that it seems like it's just a few cars, um, you know, but... Um, Obviously, the folks from the neighborhood have have spoken and seem to um, be in agreement that that just this very small number of cars may um, really neg negatively impact them. Um, so I'm looking for a little guidance from the commission here on on what is the best way to proceed, um, understanding that we have um, you know, utilities um, that we may need to access that that may that we may or may not need to access and that we are talking um, about, you know, 75 feet and between three and four cars. So I'm, I'm I need to kind of put this to the commission and ask for a little guidance on this. Um, we can certainly take a closer look at this, we can, um, you know, look across the street and see, um, you know, if we need to extend that zone, we can um, vote on the motion as it is on the floor. Um, we can continue this till next month and do a little more assessment, or we can determine that, um, you know, this is three or four cars um, and it's a, it's a, uh, a, a fairly small area. So I, I think I need some uh, guidance from other folks on the commission um at this point about what the best way to proceed is jamie go ahead i see your hand up yeah i think i guess what i would really want to understand is just given that it's um seems to be such an issue for the neighbors is you know what is the impact of cars being parked there when dpw needs to respond to an incident and you know if it takes say two hours to clear those cars by knocking on doors or getting tow trucks um what is the impact of that on those um, utility systems, you know, and does that really affect people's lives enough to cause a day-to-day -day problem um, for the neighborhood? And so, you know, so if, the, if, that's a, if that's an easy question to answer, well, great, we can have that discussion, but otherwise I would say let's defer this vote. Yeah, I mean, I can I can certainly respond to that. You know, it, it depends on what the problem is. We have a, a sewer line and we have a drain line. Um, you know, if, if we're having a, a sewer overflow, an active sewer overflow, um, we need immediate access. And the longer it takes, the more of an environmental disaster it becomes. You know, what are the odds of that happening when there is a car parked in the way, when we haven't had you know, a sanitary sewer overflow there, you know, for however many years. Um, I, I can't put a number to that. All I can do is say, you know, we did have this problem recently and we want to make sure that, that in the event we were to have this problem, um, you know, we have access. You know, a, a drain is less critical um, because it's clean water. It can definitely cause erosion. Um, you know, we need to get in there and, and arrest the situation, but that's less of an environmental disaster than if we had a sewer overflow. You know, sewer overflow requires immediate access. Um, what we would have to do, 
you know, in the event that we were having a critical problem in there, like I just described, is there would be a delay while we cobbed this patch, while we mobilized the tow truck, while we dragged the car out of the way, and then the city would have to pay the bill for that. It's about $250, um, because obviously it's not posted. So depending on how many cars had to be removed um, would depend on the cost, you know, to the city, um, but you're also losing time while you're waiting for that mobilization. So that's the answer to that question. Or a partial, uh, the best I can do sort of on short notice. Yeah, Councilor Gore, I think I say your hand up. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, I, I was thinking that maybe you could extend the no parking on the other side of the street and what, what that would look like and if that would be better for the neighbors on board. Um, that, that's, all, that's all I was thinking about. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Hillary, I see your hand up again, go ahead. Let me mute you here in a moment. Yeah, I don't think, I think it, you might have a problem getting rid of the no parking um, in, by the old Coolidge house um, because of visibility issues. I, I think there's a reason for most of that uh, being no parking and because I think you'd have a, a real uh, issue of, of dangerous uh, driving. Yep, I'm thank not, you. I'm not sure that's a, a, an answer to the problem. And, and like I said before, I don't think there is a problem. I think, um, you know, my recommendation would be just drop it. Thanks for your comment. Councillor Foster, go ahead. I guess I, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, I definitely um, respect and appreciate the idea to plan ahead um, in case there is emergency access required. And I guess by definition, we don't know when or if those will happen. Um, so it could be something that, that we end up not needing, but I um, respect given the utilities that are running under there and uh, folks haven't had a chance to look at the map, contact me and I can, show you where they're running. Um, so do wanna be sure there's access. Um, but a couple of thoughts regarding it is one, would if it would be possible to try out um, the proposal on a temporary basis um, to see how that goes and what impacts there are. Um, and then also, I, I do think it would be valuable to relook at the parking um, on the opposite side of the street um, to see if extending, uh, not getting rid of, but extending that no parking zone um, or just to make sure that that's configured in a way um, that's meeting the concerns that we're hearing here today. Thank you, Councillor. Those are uh, those are both good ideas. Diana, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment, having been involved in, and worked for a city in a previous capacity, not in this city, and being involved in a sanitary sewer leak. The I'm very aware of the often catastrophic harm that can happen, especially if if you can't repair it right away. Um, the sewer leak that I had had to deal with in a previous position ended up costing you know over a million dollars worth of damage just because if the sewage leak gets into residential properties, just the environmental remediation that even though it's such a small chance of an incident occurring, if it does occur, it can be such a big deal. And so, you know, trying to weigh that against the loud concerns that we're hearing from the neighbors, I'm wondering if, you know, if we're talking about 75 feet, but according to Nancy, if I'm understanding correctly, it sounded like 20 feet of that you already can't park in. So we're really only shortening it by shorting the parkable area by 55 feet, which would be three cars at the most. You know, if there's a way that we could look at it and, and say, you know, how, do, do we really need all 75 feet if, if it's something where we can get it down to, you know, 60 feet total, maybe then that's only two cars. And I, I would have a hard time seeing that two cars, two parking spots would, would necessarily cause big impacts in the neighborhood. Um, but you know, the, that's just kind of what I'm thinking about, but I really did like, uh, counselor Foster's idea of maybe doing something temporarily and then revisiting when we can actually get more data about the problem. Yeah, I appreciate those comments. Thank you. And it, yeah, it, I mean, what, what I struggle with is, you know, does lightning strike twice in the same place? So I'm certainly not 
um, you know, going to to this street and and trying to um, disrupt anyone's life. You know, we had a uh, you know, we had kind of a difficult situation. There was a problem. I just want to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, but I think we all hear your concerns. And that's why we talk about these things in a public setting. So based on um, and, and I thank everyone who's weighed in here um, based on the comments, what I would propose we do and um, for the counselors on the call, I just want to make sure that procedurally we've got this right, that we uh, table this um, for the month and not vote on it. And what I would like to do is post temporary no parking signs um, I, and it, we post them around the city for you know various reasons. Um, so would they say temporary no parking tow zone? And then I would ask the the neighbors who are on this call, Dave and and Nancy, um, to please be in touch with us and let us know what's happening. So we will post those signs the way this ordinance would be written um, so that we will actually see, uh, and Hillary, sorry, I should have included you in, in that list, but you give us feedback and then we also look at um, you know, potentially uh, shrinking the zone or um, you know, doing something with the area or across the street. Um, and we would ask for feedback, you know, over the next month um, or two months, because it's obviously warm and, and folks are down there. Um, and, and we would just kind of see what happens. Um, and, and then we can revisit this and, and, you know, maybe nothing will happen or maybe exactly what you're saying will happen. Um, does that sound like a reasonable solution? Um, and I see Dave's hand up, so I will uh, unmute you here. Don, I just want to say that I shared DPW info in chat so that people would have that if they needed to. Okay, yeah, so that's our email address is in the chat and you could communicate back to us, um, you know, what what you're seeing uh, on the ground. Dave, you should be unmuted, I think, or we're, we're trying to unmute you here. Maybe not. I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> Okay, maybe uh, maybe I, I see Dave's cameras off too, so maybe he's um, he's all set. Okay, so I just want to confirm with folks that, that this folks on the commission that this seems like a, a reasonable course of action, and uh, maybe Councilors Gore or Foster, is it procedurally though we have an open motion on this? Can we table an open motion, or can you give me a little procedural guidance on what we do with this? I believe we need to, um, we've tried to table things before. I think we need to continue the discussion. That is the, the language. So um, I think we, we need to vote to continue it. Okay, so do we withdraw the- oh, we have to rescind the motion. Don't we have to rescind the motion? Yeah, you, you're right, Councilor Gore. We, we could um, either rescind the motion that's on the floor or, or continue it, but rescinding is simpler. Yeah, good catch, thank you. Okay, so how, so we okay, so I need a motion to rescind the motion for a positive recommendation for this that's on the floor. Is that correct? Whoever made the motion can withdraw their motion. Yeah. Okay, so did I make ooh. that motion? I think I might have made the motion. I will rescind it if it was me. Okay, and who seconded it? That may have been me. Yeah. So okay. I will resend my second. <laughs> okay. Do we need to approve that or are we done now, Counselor? Is that procedurally? Have we done what we needed to do? So. Okay. All right. So so we will, so just to be clear about what we will do, um, my employees um, will go to Ward Ave, they will install temporary tow zone, no parking signs in the manner in which this ordinance is written. Um, that'll be done in the next few days. Um, and then I would ask um, the folks on this call, Dave, Hillary, Nancy, anyone else on Ward Ave who has a comment to please send it to DPWinfo at NorthamptonMA.gov. 
um, or you can email me uh, directly. Um, Cindy, feel free to put my um, email in the chat as well. Um, and just let us know what you're seeing. And if this creates a major problem, you know, we can pull the signs. Um, but we would ask you to please contact us and not pull the signs on your own just so that we can understand what we're seeing because um, I would like to bring this back before the commission um, for all the reasons that we talked about. Um, you know, so we'll see what this looks like and we'll also see about the possibility of either shrinking or expanding this. Um, you know, in a way that will uh, alleviate everybody's concerns here. So hopefully this is a, a good outcome and I appreciate everyone's patience as we worked through this. So thank you. Does anyone else have any further comments on this? So thanks for being flexible. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Um, okay, does anybody have any new business? Okay, hearing none, may I have a motion to adjourn please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was I'll Wayne. Second. Okay. Jody second. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none. Beth, please call the roll. Anna, would you like to adjourn? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yeah. Wayne? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. And Diana. Yes. Passes unanimously. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next month. Appreciate your time.